part of the lecture and then at the end I will have some, I think, nice applications. So we'll talk about examples that I think are very beautiful. Uh, M is two sphere and three sphere, which remarkably are completely different, two completely different examples, you would think, the two sphere and the three sphere. Completely different examples and other examples. So let's recall uh, what bundle is. Well, it's an upstairs space. You just I think it's okay to use slang like this, upstairs. Many people call this the entire space of the bundle. And it's fibered over a base. So this is downstairs. Sets. And notation is that if you take a pre image of a point in the base, this is just notation, it's called E sub B. I, this is just my own private notation, but many people use this. The downstairs space is called the base of the bundle. And this thing is isomorphic, at least bijectively, to some abstract fiber F. Each one of the fibers is, we don't choose the bijection, but can be bijectively mapped to F. And any two bijections differ by something in the structure group. So, the structure group of automorphisms that, that are, so a group of transformations on F. <clears throat> and the deal we make is any, any bijections you choose here have to differ by something in the structure too. So, so so say phi hat b inverse phi b, no matter what you choose here, has to be in the structure group. You can choose anything you want, but we make the deal that the, the difference is in this fixed group. So this is, sounds abstract, but for example, for a vector bundle, say a real vector bundle, then the fiber is Rn. Okay. So each 
The abstract fiber is our end, so each fiber concretely here in this vibration. So we have this picture of these fibra of this vibration over this base. And um, no color. No, that might be all right. And then see this is point B, and then here is the here is the fiber E B. And the deal is that this is the same as some abstract fiber. There's no real choice here. Uh, in this case, to R N. And if it's supposed to be a vector bundle, then if we have two of these maps, say phi B and phi B inverse, and and phi and phi B hat R N. Then the, being consistent here, first you go back in and then you come back. Well, let's see here, I've got it wrong. So uh, let's see here. If I if I make the map this way, it's, it's not any good. So it's gonna go be like this. Right. First you go from R N back into the fiber and then you go back into R N. So this would be phi B composed with phi B inverse. Is it is in GLNR. That says that the fiber has well-defined vector space structure. You don't care which identification you make. It's R N somehow. Okay? That's the D. For a vector one. So the fiber has well-defined. Vector space structure. Now, so far as you see, there is no uh, geometry here because there's no topology, there's nothing, there's no differentiable structure. So let's be very uh, Careful about this. We need local tri trivializations. <clears throat> and a local trivialization is this. So you have an open set, which you think of any way you want, but I'm thinking of it locally, so it is, it is somehow small. Maybe a coordinate chart, maybe not. So here's, here's M, and here's, say, some open set in here, U. And this bundle is supposed to be trivial over U, so my notation is E restricted to U. That means if, for example, here is U, then E restricted to U is everything you see above U. So inverse image under the projection of U. So this would be uh, E restricted to U. Just the vibrations over U. So E restricted to U, I say local trivialization over U, or trivialization over U, I'm thinking locally, means that this is isomorphic as bundle isomorphism to U times the fiber. Okay. Here we have this projection just restricted to you, over you. Here we have this projection. Abdul mentioned this to me uh, last time, it, that I should be careful here. I mean by this the projection on the first coordinate, just the, this silly projection. And this is, of course, the identity. So this is a local trivialization. I call these letters big feet. <clears throat> This is the trivial. Uh, this is the trivial bundle. The trivial bundle. This is the trivial bundle. U cross F. This bundle is trivialized over U by this mapping. This is a very big deal. There's a big difference between the trivial bundle and a trivializable bundle. I'm sorry to make such a. It sounds crazy, but you see, it's a map. And if some te somebody tells you that's a trivial bundle, you have to say. Really? I don't see any product structure there. He'll say, well, it's isomorphic to the trivial bundle. And then you say, great, show me the map. Right? And the map may be very, very complicated. Okay? 
So trivializing a bundle is not necessarily an easy thing to do. Okay. That's uh, what we call trivialization overuse. So let's call this trivialization overuse. require that we have, this is a requirement of a bundle. So every bundle satisfies this by definition. By definition, it's an upstairs space, it's a downstairs space, it's a mapping with fibers. They're all the same in the sense that we have some isomorphisms, but there's a compatibility condition. That the isomorphisms really induce structure on the fiber. Here, in this case of a vector bundle, vector space structure. Fiber is a vector space. This is a bundle of vector spaces, and therefore it's called a vector space bundle. In English, it's called a vector, a vector bundle, and in German, they say vector bundle, which is exactly vector space bundle. <laughs> okay, it's a bundle of vector space. You may have a, a, a bundle of groups. Yes, everything is isomorphic to a group. Well, that means these things cannot kill the group structure. That means this thing is in the automorphism group of the group. That's the thing that doesn't kill the group structure on a group. Right? Maybe a group bundle. Maybe all sorts of things. Again, you have a structure. That's the reason it's called a structure group. This thing F has structure, and the structure is given to you by the group. Yeah. This is fundamental understanding. The structure is given to you by the group. So a requirement is not only that we have all this stuff, that there is a covering mu alpha of the base with trivializations. So I'm sorry. So, oh, well, let's 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 uh, compute let's compute transition. trivialization over u alpha. That's called big phi alpha into E over u alpha. And you have another trivialization over u beta. I, of course, am assuming that u alpha and u beta intersect, otherwise there's nothing to discuss over u beta. Compute the change in trivialization phi alpha beta is we first go in with phi alpha and then we come back with phi beta. Right? This is a mapping from u alpha beta cross f to u alpha beta 
cross F. Right? Because we went in to this trivialization, came back with the other trivialization, we get a mapping over the intersection. Uh, some people have questions, and of course my notation is always U alpha beta is U alpha intersect U beta. They go in. That's a, a bundle mapping, preserves all the structure. But you come back with another trivialization, so things are going to be different. Okay? This is a vector bundle mapping. D alpha beta, a vector bundle, a fiber bundle mapping. It's a mapping of fiber bundles. That means on the base, you don't do anything. You're just fiddling around in the fiber. You're moving things in the fiber. Okay, so this thing is a, is a mapping of two variables. So phi alpha beta of x, let's say of something in the fiber z. You see, in the x variable, nothing happens, so it's x. I'm going through something that's a homework exercise now a little bit. And now something happens here. It's a transformation. I call it g alpha beta depending on x applied to z. I do nothing in the x variable because it's downstairs. Use these diagrams also, always. Do nothing downstairs. Upstairs I'm doing something, but only in the second piece. But what I do depends on the first variable. You understand that? I have a mapping of a product. And the first factor, you do nothing. But as you move the fiber, you do different things along the fiber. OK? You will have many examples, of course. Now, examples. So, if, if the fiber bundle is, for example, a vector bundle, for the time being, just think about the tangent bundle or something like this. And here I even asked you as homework exercise to compute these change of variables. Then, then G alpha beta is a mapping from, what is G alpha beta? It's a mapping from U alpha beta into G L N R. Right? Every X gets a transformation. Okay? That's what happened here, you see? Every x gets a transformation. You're changing coordinates in the fiber in some sense. So I want to draw a picture of this that everybody draws. Here's u alpha, and here's the vector bundle, for, let's say, u alpha cross Rn. And we let's separate the picture here. Here's u beta cross Rn. Uh, this whole this thing upstairs is u beta cross Rn. And in the scheme of things, these things uh, intersect non-trivially. So let's say I, I everybody draws the picture. Here is u alpha beta. I mean I've separated them so you can see better. Here, this is u alpha beta here. I've just separated the deal. So here is the here is the bundle over u alpha beta in this coordinate system, and here is the bundle over u alpha beta in this coordinate system. Two different coordinate systems. Now you're changing you're changing coordinates. That means you're changing from the this is R N. So you're changing this fiber gets gets mapped to this fiber. And this fiber here gets transformed to this fiber by a mapping G alpha beta of x. So x is here or here. But you see that as you move the fibers here, this transformation that's gluing these two things together is changing. Right? Why not? It's not constant. It's changing. It's non-trivial. So G alpha beta is a non-trivial mapping from u alpha beta to g l n r. 
Okay, so that's the notion of local triviality. Now, smooth structure. Yeah? Can you please give an example so that, I mean, for me, I cannot see why there are other vector bundles other than the trivial vector bundle. Okay, that's a very good question. So, why do we talk about So, uh, I'm going to talk about that later in, in, in the. In the uh, so Mia's question is, why all this nonsense? Probably every vector bundle is trivial. So you will see for S2 that. Huh? You will see for S2 that. Right. Well, that's what I'm going to say, but that's coming on later today. So his, uh, the question is, uh, examples uh, non-trivial uh, vector bundles. And maybe as a as a, just a general principle, you will see after much experience after experience, it doesn't take you very long to have this experience, is almost every tangent bundle is not trivial. Let me uh, let me tell you just, uh, I will, I will, I mean, uh, by the way, it's a, it's a fantastic question. Show me, show me the money. Why are you introducing all this stuff? That's, that's, that's the meaning of your question. Yeah. And I, I come back with a vague answer, almost everything's not true. <laughs> that's not very satisfying. But it is a difficult, it is non-trivial to prove that a bundle is non-trivial. It's, yes, it's also non-trivial to prove that a bundle is trivial. In any given example, it's, it's not easy, okay? Yeah. It's fundamental and not easy. Okay. Otherwise, I wouldn't discuss it. If it were trivial, I wouldn't discuss it. So let me give you a concrete example. I think you can guess that if I have a surface, the surface will have some holes in it that look like this. This is a surface and a smooth surface. That means the dimension of this manifold for the real numbers is two. And you get, you're allowed to look at it in the room. You see? You see the okay, you see a torus, but this is a multiple torus. You can imagine how you make it. You take a torus and you cut out a hole in this torus. You take another torus, cut out a hole here, and glue them. Right? That's how you make these things. These are all what we call handle bodies. You make them from the sphere. You take the sphere, cut two holes out, put on a cylinder, you've got a torus. Cut two more holes out, you get a, <laughs> a thing that, like this. Cut three holes out of a sphere and glue them. Make handle bodies. Here, the genus is three. So the genus is, is what we call a topological invariant. It's three. It's the number of holes you have. By the way, it's the only top, only invariant. Any two surfaces which are orientable, it doesn't matter what that means right now, of the same genus are diffeomorphic. Say it again. If they have the same number of holes, there's a diffeomorphism from one to the other. That's really, really interesting, right? That's really, really interesting. Really interesting. Now, just a little uh, music, uh, what we call German Zukunftsmusik, so music of the future, is the tangent bundle is trivial if and only if G equals 1. G equals 1, it's easy to see the tangent bundle is trivial. In fact, I gave you an exercise last time which more or less shows that. And I will talk about that today. G equals 1 is the case where this thing is a torch. So 
Well, that gives you an example of the situation, and a particular example that I'm going to talk about today is the tangent bundle of the two-sphere where there are no holes at all, no handles, is not true. And for us, Pardon me? Maybe it will, it will be good if, if they are doing parallel uh, the tangent bundle for S1, which is trivial, and the tangent bundle for S2, which is not trivial. Well, that's interesting. Then you ask about S3 and S4 and S5. for the time being, it's okay, you're satisfied, at least I've written some on the board. <laughs> it's really not so easy to show these things, and I will introduce invariants. You must, you must find invariants of bundles, which are numbers, and you compute these numbers. Yeah. For example, a number here, it, it might be called a churn number, and these, if the number is non-zero, then the thing's non-trivial. For example, you know, the number two is associated to the two-sphere, and the tangent bundle is non-trivial because two is not equal to zero. That's the kind of proof you make, okay? The number zero is associated to the three-sphere, and the tangent bundle of the three-sphere is trivial, and the reason it is is zero. <laughs> so the, there are invariants of bundles, which are uh, quite often just numbers that tell you whether or not the bundle is trivial or not. It's fantastic. I mean, a bundle is really complicated, and some guy says, here's the number, Jack. And you say, good, is that zero or not? And he says, no, it's not zero. And you say, it's not trivial. Then. Quite often, this number needs only to be in an integer's mod 2. So it's either 1 or 0. If it's 1, it's not 0. If it's a trivial, if it's 0, it's trivial. So things like that. Okay. It's a very, very beautiful theory that has been developed over a number of years. Okay, I'm sorry, I got off, I'm, I, well, I answered your question, and I'll let you return to the topic of smooth structures. On a fiber bundle. So, manifold structures. You can approach this in many ways, but uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you would maybe immediately do the following six requirement. <clears throat> is that this mapping, so that E and B are manifolds, the mapping should be smooth. Differential mapping. Uh, the fiber should be a manifold. With more structure, such as vector space structure and so on. And the, the identifications smooth. Now what does this mean? This EB has to, in, in, in particular, EB should be a submanifold. Should be a closed submanifold of the fiber, of the, fi of the, of the, of the, of the Everything in sight should be smooth. Just close your eyes and say, everything has to be smooth. Okay? So here's the picture. Here is E. Here is B. Here is this map which is subjective. This has now manifold structure. Some optimist, like your professor, says, well, the fiber it looks like a wonderful, smooth manifold. And 
and you ask yourself, maybe this should be automatic. Right? I mean, you have a mapping from E to B. The fiber should be a smooth manifold. Under these assumptions, we don't have enough, do we? Now, I want to talk about this a little bit. I have a mapping from one manifold to another, E to B. I draw this wonderful fiber. It's supposed to be like a vector space or something, something fantastic and closed. It is closed. It's the pre-image of a point. It's closed. But what keeps... Why not have another point over here and this fiber just unbelievably bad? What keeps that from happening? Nothing. It could happen, I think, could, could happen even in this situation. I have not required that the map from E to B is everywhere of maximal rank. Right? Do you understand? I, we have a mixed audience, not only from the point of view of background, but from the point of view of language. And so I really want background physics. There, there's something called maximal rank I want to, want to talk about. This guarantees that fibers of maps are smooth. Okay? So I want to guarantee that. I, I'm maybe exaggerating, maybe you're finding me boring at this stage of the game. So you have a, map, a mapping at C from one place to another. I don't care. I don't care. You have a mapping. I don't care. <coughs> From Rm to Rn, a smooth map. I'm going to get us all on the same page concerning the notion of maximal rank, concerning the correct understanding of what we call the implicit function theorem, or what we call the theorem on rank. I don't know what you call it. What do you call it around here? I don't know. Theorem about, about rank. About, you call it something? Yeah? Okay. I call this theorem about rank of a matter. Okay? Now, my notation is there when I write Rm comma zero to Rn comma zero. I mean that the map takes zero to zero, <laughs> okay? I mean also that I'm only considering it locally in the neighborhood of zero. Every statement that I'm going to make here is locally near, near, near zero somehow. So the statement I'm going to make is a local statement, okay? Here is the condition. We consider the mapping at the tangent level. <coughs> from the tangent space at a point, let's say, I don't care, x, from Rn, so this is some neighborhood of zero, so uh, I'm getting tired of this, Rn. I'm, I'm, I'm just talking about this thing locally, so I'm looking at the tangent map from Rn, m to Rn, locally. Okay, that's the tangent map for points near the zero, because I'm discussing it locally x to c of x. This is a linear map. Right? The map at the, at the tangent level is the linearization of the map. Right? It's a linear map from tangent space to tangent space. This varies with the point. It's just exactly like the situation here. If this varies catastrophically with the point, you're in big trouble. Do you understand what I'm saying? The rank of this linear map could sometimes be something, and then immediately something else, and something, maybe something else, something, something else, something, something else. It could go what? The first professional remark about the situation is you have some semi-continuity. That means if you, that rank, when you move, can either jump up or down. Now we have to think what happens. If rank is big here, at this point, right, and I leave it, can I get worse or better? If you can't answer these kind of questions, you, you are not a professional mathematician. So if I leave a point, do I get worse or better? Rank what? Hmm? If a rank is fixed, then it is better. 
it gets it could get better, right? The other way around, what Abdul is saying, if you move away from a point, it could get better, the rank. If you move toward a point, it could get worse. That means it could degenerate. How do you compute rank of a matrix? Computationally, you compute it with miners of the matrix being you understand how to compute rank of a matrix. Right? These are equations. So the semi-continuity statements are built into these equations, where they're zero and where they're not zero. Right? You have an equation being zero, you move away from it, it could be non-zero. Right? You move into a place, the equation so could suddenly become zero. So the rank could go down as you move in. If the rank is maximal at a point, then, you, then you're in business, because you can't go up. Right? When you leave it. Right? But he, Abdul's right. He says you could go up possibly, but there's no place to go. Right? So it stays constant. Okay. So a good condition is maximal rank at a point. Right? Okay. Right? So there's another condition that's almost as good as maximal rank, is constant rank nearby. Right? Constant rank nearby. So let's say, let's assume rank, so this is, this is rank, I didn't write it here, rank of this thing is constant near zero. This is the good condition. That's a wonderful condition. The linearization doesn't change in terms of rank. The matrices of the linearization are changing, right? But they're not jumping catastrophically around. God only knows. Yeah? So you understand, if the, if the linearization is changing horribly, then the kernel of the linearization is changing horribly. That's the, yes? The kernel of the linearization philosophically is tangent to the fiber. So the fibers are jumping around like maniacs, at least philosophically. Okay, so this is a very good condition that rank doesn't change. What is the theorem? It's called theorem about Zatz vom Rank in the Dutch. So, it's, yes, do you know the theorem? If you can't, oh, oh, do you know the theorem? So, I see a bunch of blank faces, so I, no, I'm very happy I explained this to you because uh, it's, it's uh, among the only three or four important theorems in analysis one, two, and three. So there's Stokes' theorem, of course. There's this theorem of uh, this theorem. Is there anything else important? I can't think of anything else important. These two theorems. Yeah. What else? You can think of something else. Huh? Function. That is the implicit function theorem. What I'm about to say. But before I say it, I want to remind you of the implicit function theorem for linear maps. I told you at the beginning, if you have a linear map, then if you conjugate it, then you get it in triangular form. Right? Isn't that what I said? You know how to do that. You call that Gauss method or something like this, right? Yes. Now, this is, what is G? This is, what is L? L is a map from Rn to Rn. It's an endomorphism. That says you don't, aren't allowed to change variables on one side one way and on the other side the other way. I mean, that's not fair. Right? Suppose L is a map from Rn to Rn. And you're allowed to change variables on one side and the other side. You know how to do that. One, one, one thing you can do is row reduction of the matrix, and the other thing you can do is column reduction, right? And if you, you can kill all the columns underneath, and you can kill all the, guess what you get? It's a diagonal mapping, right? So it says, by applying, if you're allowed to apply a, a, a isomorphism in the domain space and the range space, you get, in fact, a projection. <coughs> Understand that? If you're allowed to if you have a linear map from V to W, okay, and you're allowed 
to compose with first with something in the domain space, then the linear map, and then something in the range space, then you will, if, if you choose the right maps, you will get a projection. The resulting map will be f of x1 through xk, xn, and equals x1 through x. I see a question now. No? Okay, you like that. That's called the implicit function theorem for linear maps. Okay. And the same thing is true here. The good condition is, if the good condition holds, then the same result is true. Let me just state the theorem. I'm sure we're all on the same page on this. So let, let C be a mapping from Rn preserving 0 locally to Rn preserving 0 with rank of the tangent map constant. Then mappings, P2, C, P1, I always like to write inverse here. So this is the action of the diffeomorphism group on the right side, on the correct side here, the axiom on this side, this is the way diffeomorphism is acting. This, this mapping is a projection. needs to be in everybody's brain who's a mathematician. Okay. If the map is locally of constant rank, then applying diffeomorphisms in the image and uh, domain space is just a stupid map. And many theorems, many theorems can be proved this way. In particular, if we have a fiber bundle with smooth structure and I require that rank of the projection at every point x is equal to the dimension of the base. That's the, that's the condition of surjectivity of, uh, at the linear level. Then, of course, every EB is smooth. Because locally it's a constant rank. And locally, using the right coordinates, without, the think, without thinking at all, just using this implicit function theorem, locally, 
local, they say in a, in a, in a place here, the implicit function theorem is only local. The implicit function theorem tells you this mapping is a projection locally. Okay, that says there are coordinates here, so the, the vibration maybe is mysterious outside. I don't know. The vibration maybe is mysterious, but, but at least here, after taking the right coordinate, it is a projection. I don't know what, the, what happens out here and so on. I can't judge. I mean, it's a fiber bundle and so on. But here, we can really choose the right coordinates so that the mapping is really a projection onto the base. So in general, dip smooth mappings are terrible, but under a rank condition, smooth mappings couldn't be better. Okay? This is the implicit function theorem. Implicit function. So we require, this is a requirement, and everything else I've written on the board is a requirement. So E to B, P, pi, fibers, smooth identification with F, structure group, locally trivial, smooth map of, my, of constant rank. Okay. So this is equivalent to the local trivializations being smooth. is we have a smooth manifold which is where this bundle is trivial, a smooth fiber F which is the abstract fiber, a, a mapping phi alpha which is smooth which now is required to be smooth and the smooth bundle trivialization over U alpha. You can see why if you don't have experience with this and get hit with this at once, all these concepts coming together, it's a little bit overwhelming, right? At least notation-wise. But it's not overwhelming conceptually. It's a vibration over a base, which is locally trivial, trivial and everything is smooth. What else do you want? The fibers have structure, and the structure is encoded in the structure group. starting point of this whole discussion is there's no smooth structure around at all. Now I impose that everything inside is smooth, E and B and the map. So smooth manifold and then smooth map. So EB is the fiber of a smooth map with constant rank. Because of the theorem of uh, implicit function theorem, EB is smooth. I mean it's really because of the requirement. Otherwise, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, you can encode the smoothness here. You can just require a locally trivial and that these mappings are all smooth. It's the same thing because I'm, I'm making a smooth identification with this local trivialization. So, it's the same. Yeah, he's actually asking what do you mean when you mean, uh, when do you refer to a smooth set? Set, manifold, and whatever, or when do you refer to smooth map? Or... Say it again, please. So his confusion is that whenever he hears the word smooth, he thinks of a map and not necessarily. Well, oh, I'm sorry, I that may be a, a problem. Uh, yeah. When I say smooth, I mean a, a, a sub manifold. The sub manifold. So I should say that carefully. Manifold. What do I mean, EB is smooth? I mean it's a closed sub manifold of the bundle space. Okay? So remember, you, you had like you had manifolds, 
and then you put some structure, and then you call them smooth manifolds. And then on these smooth manifolds, you had some maps that satisfied some conditions, and then you call them smooth maps. Okay? And then these smooth maps, you have your own smooth manifolds. Okay, but I, I think, let, let, let me just, I'm, I'm afraid we haven't emphasized, given the question, I think we haven't emphasized this enough. So let me just uh, repeat what she's saying, what many other people are implicitly asking. The notion of sub -manifold. Okay, I think that's really what the, the problem at this stage of the game. What does it mean a sub-manifold, say, a sub-manifold, and... In M. So here is M. And now it comes, we're coming to a point where we, there's a question of taste. For me, a submanifold is closed set. Okay. So, please, I mean, I, just for myself, is it that if you have B as a manifold, then you take E as the tangent, tangent model? Is it that E has dimension double the dimension of yes? So the map phi star has the matrix of n by two n. So the matrix is n by two n. Absolutely right. So it's n by two. Absolutely n. right. And this the requirement is it has rank n. So all the all the all the rows are linearly independent. That's well, you need to find. I don't know if you got rows or columns, but uh, you need let's say uh, column wise, you need to find say it's. It's wider than it is long. So you need to find n linearly independent uh, columns. Mm -hmm. OK? That's the state. OK? OK, now let's, let's get back to his question, because he was asking, what, what the devil does it mean, really, the thing is smooth? And it means this. It's a closed subset. So it, it looks something like this, n. And it means, smooth means that in every, in every point here, there is a coordinate chart, U, and coordinates X. Let's emphasize this manifold here is dimension M and the uh, in the submanifold is, should be dimension n, so that locally u intersect here, so it's a local condition smoothness, intersect n is given by coordinates x1 equals, no, let me do it this way, x n plus 1 equals x, m, all the last coordinates equal 0. I'm defining it in the simple possible way with coordinates. I mean, you don't mind. Locally, it just looks like a, a plane. Yeah? So what your picture is, is, is that there's a coordinate chart here, x, and we come down here to Rn. Uh, what are we coming into? To, to Rm. And the manifold comes into the x-axis the way I've got it set up. And this comes down here to this. And this coordinate chart is something else. I don't know what it is. But it says that locally you can linearize it. Now that's not the usual definition. That's usually maybe a theorem. But uh, this is equivalent. So why not take this as a definition? It's locally linearizable. Right? Yeah? Can you please raise the board a bit? Because I don't see how that is the implicit function theorem. Not the one, the other one. How is that the implicit function theorem? I mean, I learned it in a totally different way, and I don't see how... Well, that doesn't mean that you learned it right. <laughs> I didn't say that. Well, it doesn't look like the implicit function theorem. No, because... Uh, then it should be, and that's the reason I never call it that, but I call it the Zatz the Zatz so that means the theorem about rank of a mapping. Okay? So, the implicit, let me state your implicit function theorem, which is usually stated in two variables. 
that you have a function of f, f of x and y, and it's equal to zero. Right? That's my you see, this is a Mickey Mouse version <laughs> that, that nobody understands. Nobody understands this version. But I will write just to satisfy you to, you know, we can have well, a... They don't see any link, that's the problem. Well, then that's the homework exercise. <laughs> f of x, y equals zero, some condition, plus a condition. Now, so, so here we go, here we go, here we go. Here's x, here's y, and that's because in Mickey Mouse math you only do things in, variable, in two variables. So, you have here f of x, y. Now, that's one function of two variables. Now, as you know, the zero set of one function of two variables could be anything. It can, it's closed. <laughs> but I think that's it. I think that's the only condition, right? It's closed. Now you have some idea that this thing looks like that. Right? That's what your idea is. Well, your idea is that it's a graph. Right? This is not graphical, this is a castle. You know the German word graph. I don't know. Some <laughs> This is not graph. This is this is graph of the function. Yes? And so you say it should be y of x. Right? In high school you go on y of x, right? Right? Y of x. Under some condition, this implies that this set uh, it is just the graph. Of y, of y goes to y of x in a very strong sense. That's what you've learned. Yes. Okay. That's, you see, it's an immediate consequence of, the, of, the, of my theorem, a trivial consequence. Excuse me. The condition is, the condition is that this function has maximal rank. This is the condition. Yes. Right. So it's a projection. So if it's a projection, that is, if it's a projection, if I have to change the variables, this function looks like this. I'm not uh, too terribly upset about proving a theorem. Right. Now this Mickey Mouse uh, 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 implicit function is I have nothing against it, but as, but the real theorem is what I wrote. Okay, and we use it all the time in mathematics, all the time. The map has a constant rank, then applying diffeomorphism in the image and domain space, conjugating in that sense, gives you a projection. Pro professor, uh, do you have any like, materials of, of the proof of this theorem? Yes. This theorem is an immediate consequence of the inverse mapping theorem. The inverse mapping... That was the other theorem. No, I will tell you, I'm glad. I'm, no, I thought you heard about the inverse mapping theorem, so I will tell you that. That says, yeah. yes, but it's really cool because we proved the inverse mapping theorem using this, not the other way around. Hmm? Well, I don't know. The inverse mapping theorem norm normally is proved with some fixed point theorem, so I don't know. Okay. So if you have, you can just add some variables and make this work as a uh, jack it up to an invertible mapping and you're finished. So this is standard theorem, so read any book uh, on analysis. But I mean, the theorem you wrote, because in the analysis book, it's the, you said the Mickey Mouse can version of the implicit function right. theorem, not this one. <laughs> no, that's, this is the Mickey Mouse version. Yeah, yeah. yeah but I mean, how, could, do you know any proof for the theorem which is not Mickey Mouse? Yeah, sure, I know proof. You want me to prove it? I mean, it, yeah. I, I don't want to spend a half an hour here. I'll prove it. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. I mean, but, I, it, it, but you can look in, in, in any calculus book uh, you went and uh, the series. Okay, I'm sure that this is proved in Warner. Uh, uh, somebody here was fit. Uh, he's not coming to the lecture anymore. He's too tired. <laughs> but in any any uh, in any uh, serious copy of this book, you will find it. This this kind of uh, implicit function theorem is the thing you learned in high school.
And, and, and I agree, this, this somehow looks much more like an implicit function here, right? Because you implicitly solve this equation, right? Yeah. Can you, I mean, maybe it's obvious, but I don't see yet the link between the two. I mean, I see that the condition is the same in that theorem and in this theorem. But how is the, like, the end okay. result the same? I don't see it. I mean, I don't want to ruin your lecture, but I, I, mean, I really don't see it. Well, I said you have to compose with diffeomorphism on both sides, and you get a project, and you get actually a linearization, not only just this graph. So this graph will occur as the image of, of the linear piece by diffeomorphism. That's what y of x is. Just, just write it down. So, uh, by the way, you ask about textbooks, which are excellent in, in this area. The textbooks of Spivak are old, but excellent. Do you know the name Spivak? One textbook is called Calculus on Manifolds. He has a six-volume series called Differential Geometry, and volume one is, is the fundamentals uh, that you need. And I'm sure that this kind of stuff is pretty good. I highly recommend taking a look at Spivak's. His first elementary book is called Calculus on Manifolds. Note, G, L, M, R is a manifold. I'm coming back now. So we got lost, but I'm very thankful for all these nice questions. We, I'm coming back to this discussion here. Note that GLNR is a manifold, and note that we have a smoothness condition here, and if you check it, this is an interesting check, the smoothness condition means, the smoothness condition above, so I need to go down. call this star, and I mean this condition here, the smoothest condition of, of that is the same thing as requiring G alpha beta from U alpha beta into G ln R is smooth. See, what is, this is a mapping of two variables somehow or another. Uh, where is it? Uh, well, where is the mapping? It's, it's, it's gone now. So originally, we had a function of two variables. We had g alpha beta of x and z. So x, z goes to this. this But in fact, in this case, it is enough 
to check that these mappings are smooth. Okay. So let me summarize what a vector bundle is. A vector bundle over a manifold, a smooth vector bundle over a manifold, with fiber Rn and structure group GLNR is the same thing as a collection of smooth mappings from U alpha beta to GLNR. In the homework you have seen already, uh, and I don't maybe wanted to comment on this here toward the end of the lecture because Alexandros was a little bit, you're okay now, right? But maybe other people were not. So, a vector bundle, this is the local trivialization. This is how you do the local trivialization. You check formally, it's not difficult, it's a formal calculation. values in a group, G beta gamma, multiply values in a group, G gamma delta, is nothing other than G alpha, I went to alpha to beta, beta to gamma, gamma, oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go to delta, I want to go back to alpha, no, what do I want to do? Oh, I got it here wrong. Alpha to beta, what? U alpha, U beta, <laughs> Did you ever call this this diagram something in high school? We had a name for something like this in our high school. It's called Venn diagram. So you have this intersection here. So you go from you transform from u alpha to u beta, go from u beta to u gamma, and no, or yeah, and you go from u gamma to u alpha to u beta, u beta to u gamma. U gamma to U alpha. Oh, ah, 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 I would rather write it this way. Go so U alpha to U beta, U beta to U gamma. That's the same thing as going from U alpha to U gamma. Of course, on U alpha beta gamma. All right? You can imagine, that has to be. All right? There's a statement in the group, and also U alpha beta is equal to uh, G alpha beta is equal to G beta alpha inverse, and these conditions are called co-cycle conditions. Professor, so I had trouble in the homework. Okay, good. The indices were the other way around. So if you define G alpha beta coming from phi beta minus one times phi alpha, and you do G alpha beta times G beta gamma, the things in the middle don't go. The things in the middle don't go. You sure you make a mistake. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, I did it. She checked it. Uh, so I may have written it wrong. Do you checked it the way I wrote it? I think it, right? it was correct, yeah. So when you checked it, it was correct. Yeah. You can't get it to go right. No, I mean, if you just change the order, it's just the thing of the order of the indices. Yeah, G that's beta right. alpha, gamma, gamma beta, then you get it right. But I yeah, it's a question of what is G alpha beta and what's no, G I mean, beta. It's, yeah, it's correctly, the, the idea is correct, but I, like formally, the indices, I had really big trouble because it didn't go away. Okay, but you, you, you should change the indices if you have trouble. So it's either G alpha beta or G beta. No, alpha. because you said G alpha beta is phi B minus 1 phi alpha, yeah? Right. You said that. And when you put them one near to the other, they don't go away. That's why 
Well, I don't know. So you start with gamma and you go back into the thing and come back to beta. You go beta, you go into the thing and come back to alpha. You should say have the same thing starting with gamma and coming back alpha. I don't. No, because the first map, yeah, g alpha beta. Yeah. It 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 takes elements. I mean, it goes from alpha to beta, and the other one is. So g alpha beta is yeah. phi beta minus one. No, it goes from alpha to beta. No, this is how you define it in the beginning. This is how you define it. That's right. The way I wrote it, and he's debating debating whether this is right or not. But he, who knows who's right here? So let's just. This is the way I wrote it. Okay. As a vector bundle set. And then I wrote yeah, here. Yeah, it's all the same. You may be right, I don't know. This is the notation I use, and it's possibly incompatible with the way I wrote the code. Co yeah, that was my so that's, that's you know, okay. change, if it's incompatible, change it. I wrote it also in coordinates, and I, I have to change the indices. Okay, that's good response. I think it was correct, but maybe. I thought it was correct too, but you know, it's very hard to change, know the difference between a map and its inverse. Yeah. And so you may have to be right. So it's rather just check it. Get the right order. No, because I, I search in the literature and some people use it this way, some people use it the other way around. And I usually use it this way, but if you use it this way, maybe what you're saying is I need to change the cocycle condition around. What you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is a cocycle condition, and this is exactly the same as a vector bundle. So you give me cocycles, I build a vector bundle with these cocycles. That was the homework exercise. And you give me a vector bundle, and I get the cocycles. Now, now, one last remark. Again, what did I just say? Some guy gives me a vector bundle, and I get the cocycles. Right? I start with cocycles, I build the vector bundle by gluing. Yeah? Or fiber bundle, doesn't matter. Okay? Again, what is left open in this procedure? You give me a vector bundle, I get the cocycles. What is open in this procedure? You see what I'm saying? What do I have to do to get the cosines? We've just been discussing it. Right? I need to trivialize the bundle locally, right? There are many ways to trivialize the bundle. Right? Okay? So the question is, when are two cocycles equivalent? Right? I have a cocycle through one trivialization through another, so the question you should ask when do G alpha beta and G alpha beta hat define the same bundle? I think I'm going to uh, formulate that as a homework exercise. Let's just let me just tell you right now formally what the answer is. It's The answer is 
if there are smooth mappings into the group G alpha and G beta, so that conjugating in this sense, you go from one to the other. So this says these two co-cycles define the same vector bundle uh, of diisomorphism. Or fibromyalgia. Okay, that's not surprising. Okay. So I think at this stage I don't want to say any I can't say any more today, we're finished, so. Thank <laughs> you.